This is the Body Wise Podcast. Thank you for joining Laura and Christina for another intimate exploration of collective wisdom. Hey everyone, it's Christina Kerp, your host, and I'm super excited for this episode. For one, Laura and I will be on this episode together, but with a guest, which we haven't done um, three people in a while on here. So I'm really stoked about that. It's going to be a great conversation. Our guest today is so inspiring. Her story is just incredible from marketing executive to holistic health coach and just someone, you know, she's a, an NTP, she's a functional diagnostic nutrition, she's FDN certified as well. And she just helps so many people take control of their health and wellness. But her personal story of over her, what she's overcome is just beyond. So, I'm, you know, we're going to talk all about that today. Heather has overcome Hashimoto. She put it in remission, lichen sclerosis, and she also overcame vulvar cancer, which she, you know, went a little conventional, went more holistic, made really strong, informed choices, which I think can be some of the scarier things to do when we're dealing with the C diagnosis, the C word. So we're really going to dive into all of that as well as have conversations about intimacy after gynecological cancer and what that's like. And I know I can relate to that personally, having hydronized superativa, it's a condition that also affects, you know, like around my genitals, kind of like my inner thigh groin area. And so there is um, you know, dealing with that of like having scarring and just like not like, you know, desirable um, appearance around, you know, some private areas and, and what, what it's like, what's intimacy like when you're dealing with that. So what's going to be a really um, intense and um, awesome and informative and intimate episode. Before we jump into all that, I'm really excited to, um, you know, give a little spot to our new sponsors. As you guys know, I am all about food as medicine and the OG food as medicine is bone broth. I mean, as old as time, I feel like bone broth is, you know, what our great, 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 great grandparents um, were drinking and sipping on when they weren't feeling so hot. And Kettle and Fire is an all-in-one, you know, bone broth nutrition source for your body. I love that it's shelf stable, you know, so you can make your own, you can buy frozen ones, but when you just need something that's in the pantry, ready to go every time for your whole 30 keto paleo AIP recipes, Kettle and Fire is ready to go. Plus it's pretty much found at every grocery store around like nationwide in the US and you can get it delivered straight from them to your doorstep. It's made with clean, real ingredients, carefully crafted by world-class chefs. They have really amazing flavors like a mushroom one and a turmeric one and just like all these different flavors coming out. And it's made again with no BS, grass-fed, grass-finished um, like cattle bones, pasture-raised chicken bones, organic veggies and spices. It's quick and convenient again, you're ready to sip in seconds. You just open up the little carton. And what I love about, you know, bone broth is that it's, you can sip on it as a snack or add it into your recipes. I know for me, bone broth is like, you know, a, a, a staple in my kitchen and for so many of my delicious recipes, recipes. And so I love the kettle fire just makes it really accessible to everybody. So again, check out the link in my bio in the notes for this, um, to get to more details on kettle fire and get it shipped straight to your door. All right, now on to our episode, and I am so stoked. Um, welcome, Heather and Laura. Georgios, can you cut out that welcome at the end? Because I'll welcome them when they're on air. I just, I don't know why I did that. Thanks. Welcome, Heather and Laura. It's good to have you on here with us today. Thanks so much for being here. We're so excited to have you. And just, I really want to just start with like telling us your incredible story <laughs> because it's incredible. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I really, really appreciate you guys having me. I love this show. The guests that you have had on BodyWise have been so different and so important. I love it. I listen to every single episode and it's great. Thank you. Uh, so me, um, well, I went through a pretty serious health crisis. Um, it, in 2017, I, was, I had a really, really like toxic job situation. And I was working a ton of hours, stressing myself out, not treating myself very well. And um, I have always had a situation where my vulva is not healthy. Uh, it's itchy, it's, the skin is thin and white and it tears very easily and it stings when I go to the bathroom and it hurts when I wipe with just regular tissue. Um, it hurts when I wear jeans and it rubs in that area. And this has been happening since I was like eight or 12 years old for as long as I can remember. 
but in 2017, it was at the worst it's ever been. Um, like the skin in the entire vulva was white, like white, like a piece of paper, not like white, like I'm a white girl, like white, like paper um, and shiny and just kind of weird. And I developed a tear and the tear wouldn't heal. So it was like a wound and it wouldn't heal for like months. It wouldn't heal. And then the itch kind of changed a little bit instead of just being normal, like jock itch itchy. It was very, very stinging and very, very painful. Um, it started to have issues kind of walking normal and those types of things. Um, and then a growth grew out of that tear. It looked kind of like a pimple, but like what like mushroom shaped almost. And so I was like, okay, well, it's time to actually find a doctor who knows what is going on. Because up until this point, every doctor I had seen, oh, it's an allergy. Oh, it's a yeast infection. Oh, you need to work on your personal hygiene. Oh, it's the, the tissues or the feminine hygiene products or the underwear you like, we went through everything. It's your soap, like all of those things. Um, so I went to Dr. Google and coach YouTube and I started to try and figure out what the heck was going on with my symptoms. And I, stumbled upon a condition called lichen sclerosis, which is an autoimmune condition um, where your immune system attacks your vulva. Uh, it mostly shows up in women, but it does occasionally show up in men. It usually shows up in postmenopausal women, uh, but it will occasionally show up in children, which was interesting and everything matched. And so I started to join those support groups online and learn more about what these women were suffering from. And I'm like, yep, that totally makes sense. Then I learned that lichen sclerosis, if gone untreated, will develop and progress into vulvar cancer and present in the, like, like a growth or a different color pimple looking thing or lots of different ways. I'm like, oh crap, I probably have both. So I essentially self-diagnosed. And then I went and found a specialist that knows what's going on with the vulva. And so at first I called around to gynecologists because I didn't have one at this time because they had never helped me out. So why bother? Um, and so I couldn't get into a gynecologist for like three or four weeks. And so I went ahead and made a couple of appointments. And then I stumbled on a doctor here in Phoenix by the name of Joseph Brooks, who is a vulvar specialist. I called his office and I specifically asked, do you guys know what lichen sclerosis is? Is it something you deal with? Because the other gynecologist I scheduled with had no idea. And they were like, oh, absolutely. We 100% deal with that every day. We can get you in in 48 hours. And I was like, hallelujah. So I scheduled that appointment. I went in and he, he was actually a different experience than I've ever had. So he brought me into his office first and with his um, attending nurse or PA. And we sat down and we had a conversation about my history. He actually took a full-blown history. When did you start your menses? Um, what's your sexual like history like? What's going on with your symptoms? And I told him everything. Um, I happened to also have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which I was diagnosed with, I think in 2005. Um, and it was just, he's like, oh yeah, classic textbook sounds like lichen sclerosis. And he's like, let's take a look. And then I said, also it's developed into something a little scary. I hope you don't find cancer. And he was like, I hope not. He was like taken aback. And then we got into the exam room. He's like one look and he's like 100% this is lichen sclerosis. And then he was like, how long has it been like this? Like, how long have you had this? So, well, I'm 37 now. So what is that like 25 years since I was like eight or 12? It's been a while. And he was just kind of like shocked. And he was like, and no doctor has helped you. And I said, nope, I go through paps and do all the regular stuff and skin's white and Nobody seems to care. When I go in and ask about itching and stuff, they examine and they're like, I don't know, maybe it's an allergy. So I just gave up and I quit and I accepted that those symptoms were gonna be just me, that's just normal. And he's like, oh, okay, 100% this is not normal. And then he noticed the growth and the growth happened to be um, near my clitoris. So there's that little triangle where your love button sits. Mine was in the lower left-hand corner. So if you're like looking at me, my left. And he was like, touching it and like pressing on it because the difference between cancer and non-cancer is usually fluid filled versus solid mass. And he's like, he's like, that could definitely, that could be some, yeah, could be some cancer in there. He's like, I'm going to have to biopsy. So he took a sample, did a punch biopsy of the growth itself, sent it off and came back and it was positive for squamous cell cancer. And it was keratinizing, which means it developed out of the tear from the lichen sclerosis. 
And so in 2017, I got diagnosed with both in one doctor's visit, um, con confirming what I already suspected. And so began my journey to try and figure out how to heal my body. So let's start there. <laughs> wow. Okay. So when you get the diagnosis, obviously getting like the, the, the cancer, just, just when people say like cancer, like the C word, it's kind of like, it's paralyzing. Right. Mm -hmm. And I love that, you know, on your about me page, you talk a lot about informed consent and yes. you know, you didn't exactly go the conventional route. So talk to us about that. Where did you find, like, how are you so decisive? And like, this is what I want. And where did you find kind of the fortitude to, you know, say, hmm, like, feel like an equal partner. Cause a lot of people, they go into a doctor's appointment and the doctor says we're doing ABC and they're like, let's go. But I feel yep. like you were someone who was like, well, let's talk about that. Let's think you kind of, and you came in with your ideas and what you thought and you pushed for that. So uh, let, tell me more yep. about that. Cause I think that that's just really important. Absolutely. And this is like one of my big soapbox items now is self-advocacy, bodily autonomy, informed consent, like that. That is what I learned through my journey. And that is what I'm hoping to like bring out and educate and instill in other women. Uh, so treatment was what I had to investigate. So I was at a happy hour with some friends at work. Um, I used to work in the marketing field, kind of like high up executive level. A lot of my colleagues were men, not usually women. I've always been a pretty open like guys, gal, ballroom kind of girl. <laughs> so I talk about my vulva openly <laughs> among my colleagues, whatever. They all knew what I was going through. And I had missed the call from my doctor during that happy hour. And I was checking and checking and checking. And I saw that I missed it. And so I stepped outside, took the call. And he said, so your biopsy results came back and there's a little bit of cancer there. I don't know what the hell a little bit of cancer means, but he was trying to be gentle. And even though I was prepared and I knew that it was going to come back positive, my body just told me that's the way it was going to be. I still got that spin, you know, like that stereotypical in the movies, that like blur of everything that, that really does happen. <laughs> and that happened to me. And so he said, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to refer you to a gynecological oncologist that I work with very closely. And he's someone that I trust. I've seen his work. He does a great job, surgeon. Um, and he is someone I would refer my closest friends and family to. He's like, I would send my mom, my sister, these guys to this man. Okay, cool. So I set up an appointment. There was some referral funny business where they sent it. They didn't get it. So I finally had to interject there and make sure it got to the right place. Got my appointment set up, went in. And my first appointment, um, I'm, I saw the doctor for like five minutes. So I came in, he's a teaching doctor. So he had residents. The resident came in, told me what generally happens when you have this type of diagnosis. The first line of defense is always surgical removal. So with any type of cancer, if it's a low enough stage, they just try and remove as much of the cancerous tissue as possible through surgery. And then if they have to, they will address the remainder with radiation and chemotherapy. Unfortunately, those are the only three tools in the conventional toolbox when it comes to cancer treatment. Cut it out, burn it out, or poison it, unfortunately. That's, I mean, it's 2017 at this point. What the heck? We're not more advanced? There are some other options in terms of um, experimental treatments that kind of fall under the clinical trial umbrella. But those are, once you've gotten through all the others, those are usually the last resort in terms of offering those to you. And I said, okay, well, surgery makes sense. Because of the location of my growth, my tumor close to the clitoris, he said, there's a good chance I'm going to have to remove your clitoris. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So I read that there is a 40% chance of reoccurrence. It's like 12 to 37% for this type of cancer. So you want to like, go balls to the wall and remove important body parts right off the bat, knowing that I might have to <laughs> go through this again later. And he was like, my job is to address that cancer and get it out of you. He's like, so I need to take as much tissue as I need to get rid of as much cancer as tissue as possible. And I said, okay, well, I'm not cool with that. And he said, well, the other option is you, I can take as much as I can get while leaving that organ intact. And then we can see what pathology says in terms of next steps. So that is the option I chose. Um, and you're absolutely right, especially when it comes to cancer treatment. The doctor says, this is the treatment path. And the patient says, when do I start? And there are usually no questions asked. And I think that's a problem. I think more people, all people need to be very invested in their care and need to know exactly what's going on. Um, the thing that I'm seeing with women that I'm talking to now that are going through vulvar cancer diagnoses is that they're waking up with pieces and parts missing that they didn't expect to be missing. 
that's a whole additional level of trauma on top of this diagnosis and stress that they have to go through through treatment. And it's because they didn't ask those questions. So in my appointment, I saw the resident, she explained all of this. And then the doctor came in and he said, any questions? Nope. Okay. Let's get to the exam. He's like, okay, yeah, you might have to have the clit removed. Give me my options. And then that was that he was out of there. Didn't really explain to me like how deep he was going to have to go into the surgery. Nothing, mm. nothing. He said, I do want to biopsy the lymph nodes that are closest to the, the site. And so we'll do that as well. Turns out, I learned later, you can't really biopsy a lymph node because they're so small. They have to be removed completely. That was not explained to me. Biopsy in my mind means you're going to take a sample. So I woke up with four lymph nodes missing, one on the right side and three, that adds up to four, <laughs> on the left side. And so now I've got a little pocket of lymphedema in my pubis mons that I have to deal with. Thank goodness, mine's like a quarter size and it's not a big deal. Uh, as long as I'm active every day, eat a low inflammatory diet, and um, take some herbs that move my lymphs, then I'm good to go. That's not the case for many women that go through this type of surgery. And so that was it. So we went through the surgery. He took out as much as he could. Of course, we did not get clear margins in pathology. So what they're looking for is a clean margin around the tissue sample that is free of cancerous tissue. So mine was clean on one side, but I still had cancerous tissue on the other sides. And so he said, well, now you need to either let me go in for a second surgery and let me take whatever I need to take to get it all. Or you need to go through radiation treatment with low dose chemotherapy. And I said, okay, I'm still not okay letting go of my clitoris. And he couldn't understand why. He's like, can't you orgasm like other ways? I was like, okay, first of all, this is not about orgasm. <laughs> I mean, I would like to be able to orgasm and that's huge. But I can't imagine the rabbit hole of like identity change that I would have to go down if you removed that organ, like, like sense of femininity, sense of like self as a woman, sense of like, whoa, that's a lot. <laughs> and it's a lot bigger than just a little bit. I mean, Laura talks about this on the right. podcast. Like it's a whole web. Like it's not just, right. you know, so I feel like he's talking about something. I'm like, do you know? <laughs> like, do yeah, you I, know? <laughs> I would right. love to jump in there because I mean, I'm. I'm having such an emotional response to your story, Heather. I'm so infuriated and angry and I wanna cry. And, and I, I feel that way because, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to your story and it feels like, I know, I know what you're talking about in terms of being educated, doing the research, going in there to get the information, pushing back, pushing back to protect yourself, to make those empowered choices. You know, you have to go in there and you have to be on and you have to know your shit. And you also have to like push back to, to get what you need as in like life-saving treatment. And then right. also to protect yourself from medical injury, medical assault, from trauma. I mean, so it's such a complex situation that most people don't understand. They're like, well, they're the doctors. They know what they're doing. They're the ones that study this <laughs> really well maybe if you had the body of a female and you actually engaged in that world you would know what you're talking about that it is hostile territory but it is it's like it is like going fetching water in a war zone okay you need to get the water to survive but there's a chance you might die or lose a limb in the process that's exactly right and the amount of labor required not only are we as women as just like just so much is expected of us and the world that we want to create and the, our bodies and everything that we're up against we also have to become these medical experts we have to become experts of our bodies we also have to have the capacity to stand up to authority which not all women have especially because so many women are dealing with trauma like that's very much linked to authority. So walking into a medical center and many, many times dealing with a man questioning you, wondering why you're so adamant about holding on to a body part. I mean, all of that. And like you said, you woke as prepared as you were and as highly educated as you are and as much work you, that you put into it, you did wake up with lymph nodes missing. And it's not just that they're missing is that there's a consequence to that that was not ever explained to you. No one sat down to say, well, if we do this, 
let's talk about what life looks after. Uh, so many women go in and are either prescribed something, given something, it doesn't matter. There's, there's no information. It's like, here, that'll fix this immediate problem. Even if it's gonna end up cultivating five more issues for you, we're not gonna talk about that right now. Let's, let's just do this. And that is, that is an injustice. And that is unacceptable. And you're right, we do have to become educated and we do have to go in there and we do have to do the work, but that's also, we have to hold these people accountable. That's the first step. Essentially, we do have to do the work. Yes, the medical system has to change. Yes, the education of our healthcare providers has to change, but it's going to only happen when we demand that it be so. I mean, we are in a private, healthcare economy. So we are clients. We can't, we do have the power to demand more, but we have to have higher expectations and take that power back. I'm off with the rent. I'm so moved by your story and I'm so happy that you're here. And please, I, I'd love to hear how, obviously in that place where you were, you decided to, you know, go against the tide. And at this point, after years of like, of having a condition that you eventually had to self-diagnose, okay, now I, I can see how well self, um, like diagnosing a protocol for yourself is not that far away for like taking that ownership and deciding, well, look, these people may know something, but they surely don't know everything. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out what's right for me. Clearly that's been the best route. So I'd love to hear more about that and how you kind of combine those, those modalities. You got it. Um, so I love that you mentioned that we're clients of the medical system. I coach everyone I come across, no matter what they're dealing with, to know that you are hiring your healthcare team and you are responsible for putting that team together. And it's not just one doctor that's going to tell you what's what, and you're just going to roll with it. Like, do you accept that from your car mechanic or do you ask questions and you know what you're spending money on? You know what's wrong with your car, at least enough to, for you to give consent for them to fix it and them to bill you. We need to think about medical care in the same way. So I love that you said that. That's huge. Uh, so I went through surgery and they weren't able to get it all. So he gave me the options and I said, no more surgery. I'm still not going to let you take my clitoris if I can help it. So then he sent me to the radiologist and I said, okay, well, let's have a chat with the radiologist and see what we're dealing with. And he took me through radiation treatment, what it looks like, what it does. Um, I would have had to go, go through 35 pretty high um, level treatments. And that's every single day for 35 days. And so he gave me a printout. He's like, these are the side effects. And it was like totally frying the skin in that area. I would have lost all elasticity. I would have lost my clitoris anyway, in terms of it would have been fried and the nerves would have been dead, at least on the part that's available on the surface. Um, what else? My mucus glands in the area would have been fried. So I would not be able to self lubricate anymore. Um, my reproductive organs would have been fried. So I would have to go into premature menopause. I could have lost my bladder, my bowel. I could have burned my intestines together. Um, the side effects of radiation are no joke. And those are just the immediate side effects. Then there's the long-term side effects, bone pain, lymphedema, like all these major things that are chronic that happen to the body with that kind of damage. And I was like, well, that sucks. And he goes, he literally said to me, I'm so sorry that your options are shitty or shittier. <laughs> like he knows yeah. the standard of care is what it is. And that is the toolbox he's allowed to work from. So he was basically telling me in my medical opinion, I would not go through this if you don't have to, I would take the surgical option. And I was like, wow. And my husband was with me in this uh, appointment and he was like blown away. He's like, I can't believe they do this to people. I just, I can't believe. And then he's like, well, what are you gonna do? And I'm like, well, if I go either of these routes, our sex life is gonna be broken and my whole identity is gonna be broken and my body is gonna be messed up. And he was like, I just, he didn't understand. And I said, think about it this way. Uh, if you are facing these kinds of, of radiation treatment side effects or cutting off the head of your penis, like that's literally what this is, which would you choose? And he was like, oh, uh, I can't, I can't, I can't even, he's like, wait a minute. If that was a man, would, would these treatment options be the same? 
<laughs> Good, Good question. question. Good question. So um, I went to my naturopath. I've been seeing a naturopathic doctor since 2005 when my Hashimoto's was uh, diagnosed. Turns out that I've got uh, food allergies, sensitivities. So gluten and dairy are my big ones. And so I've been working with her forever. And I went into the office and I laid out on the law, like this is what they're telling me I need to do from the conventional route. And she said, first of all, do not let them bully you into any kind of treatment that you're not comfortable with. She said, the type of cancer that you have, squamous cell, is actually a very weak cancer and it can be knocked out by alternative or natural means. And she told me a story about a client of hers or a patient of hers that had uh, ovarian cancer, which also tends to be squamous cell. And she was treating with my naturopath and she was doing very, very, very well. And then she decided to change direction for who knows why and went the conventional route and ended up going through radiation and chemo like they're telling me to. And she did lose her bowel and she had a stoma put in and then she had bowel or bladder issues for the remainder of her life. She's like, so just know like these side effects are legit. I've seen it happen, but I've also seen success on the other side. And she had several other case studies where she had actually been able to get folks into remission going down an alternative route. And then because I live in Phoenix, which is the Mecca of natural and holistic medicine, she gave me a referral to another clinic in town where I could actually work with a naturopathic oncologist. And so I went in to meet with them and they were very different in their approach. And it was very much the ND type situation, the naturopath that I'm used to, where they listen to you and they treat you as a person versus treating your tumor. And that's the difference between conventional and natural cancer treatment is conventional treats the tumor, natural treats the terrain of the tumor. And in my opinion, you need both. And I did both. I reduced my tumor burden with the surgery, but then I also did um, high dose vitamin C intravenous injections, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, hyperbaric oxygen chamber therapy, uh, and a therapeutic ketogenic diet. Now, therapeutic ketogenic diet for cancer treatment is not the internet weight loss keto diet, just in case anybody out there is concerned. Uh, we're not talking about like keto treats and junk and all of that. We're talking about a very clean, and then in my case, without food sensitivities diet, that's extremely high in fat. Um, and I was tracking my blood ketones and my glucose every single day and keeping a real close handle on my glucose ketone index or GKI, which is a mathematical equation that lets me know that I'm in therapeutic ketosis because we wanna keep glucose as low as possible and ketones as high as possible so that we can suppress some of the tumor growth pathways um, as well as make cancer a little bit uncomfortable because it does feed primarily on glucose. It's not the only thing that it feeds on. So that's what I did. And I was diagnosed in uh, August of 2017. I was cancer-free in February of 2018. So next wow. month, three years. Wow, wow. That's that is amazing. And in what the process, uh, Hashimoto's went into remission, lichen sclerosis went into remission, estrogen dominance reversed. I lost 70 pounds. Like the list goes on and on and on in terms of healing. So wow. it was the best thing I could have ever done. Wow. And so therapeutic keto for those listening, like, right. It's not like I do keto. I do lower carb. You know, it's not that it's not like the five, 10, 20. This is like, I mean, like, what is it like 70, 80% of your calories are coming from fat. Yeah. It's yeah. at least 85, 90 plus. Right. Right. It's like a lot of fat, it's like a lot. And then, yeah. um, very, very little protein and like almost no carbs. Right. Yeah. I didn't go as low on the protein as a lot of the, um, experts recommend. I was still eating like a ribeye steak, but I was just using it as a vehicle for fat. <laughs> yeah. Right. I basically lived off of my fat bomb ice cream recipe. So it was like a lot mm -hmm. of, um, Oh, the fat that's in chocolate. What's it called? Oh, cacao butter. There you go. Yes. yes. Cacao butter. Cause I'm, nice. I'm no dairy. So it was a lot right. of that, a lot of coconut, a lot of avocados. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's incredible though. And I mean, it's interesting that how your Hashimoto's went into a remission too. And that's probably due to, because it was a high fat and like not essentially the, not a low calorie diet, which is right. I think where people go wrong when they, a lot of people correlate like low carbon Hashimoto's don't work out so much, which I think per person varies, but I always say like the common denominator isn't so much the lack of carbohydrates as it is you're you're cutting your calories, which is what your yes. thyroid really doesn't like. Yes, absolutely. I did some intermittent fasting as well um, in there. It just kind of naturally happened eating that much fat. You're in such a deep level of ketosis that you're just not interested in eating all the time. So I just ate as much as I could in single sittings um, or maybe two, two meals a day. Right. 
Uh, but yeah, super, super high fat. Like I don't think most people could stomach an actual true therapeutic ketogenic diet unless they had to. Yeah, I can see that. I can totally see that where it can be a little hard to digest. But you also, other than diet, you did some lifestyle changes. So you left your job. Yeah, I, I did to ask about that. I overhauled my entire life. So yes. what was cool about going through naturopathic treatments is um, I went into the clinic and I sat in the IV room for an hour to an hour and a half while this large bottle of nutrients went into my system through IV. And then I went into the hyperbaric oxygen chamber for um, another was it an hour or 90 minutes? It was a while. So I just go in there with a book or a meditation or whatever, and just chill and get all the oxygen. So I was there for a long time, but every single appointment, and I went in three times a week for uh, four months, every single time I met with the oncologist and she'd say, how you feeling? How are you doing? Uh, is there anything that you want me to change? Cause they would customize my IV for me every time I went in. So if, if I was feeling tired, she might add a little bit more B12. If I was feeling constipated because detox has to happen when you're shedding these types of, of cells, uh, she'd add some magnesium. So she would mix it up depending on how I was feeling and what was going on with my body, but she would also give me a handout. So one day it would be, I want you to add grounding. So I would go outside and put my naked body to the ground, whether it was my feet or my butt or whatever it was. So I'd get in the ground. The next time I want you to get X number of hours or minutes in the sunshine. Uh, the next one would be first thing in the morning, I want you to get outside and get sun in your eyes, regulate that circadian rhythm. So every single time I went in, there was something new. She had me dry brushing. She had me doing oil pulling, which is disgusting, but my teeth got wider and my gums, gums like healed. Uh, what else did she have me doing? I ended up doing some Reiki and some energy healing stuff. She had me doing all kinds of stuff. And I also quit my job. So I used to be a um, what did they call me? Uh, Vice president of demand marketing for a tech company that was VC backed. So whenever you have like venture funding inside of a business, they're looking to make that money back. So I was responsible for basically the revenue of the company and feeding the sales team. Pretty high profile, very high stress. Um, the last job that I, I had was great, but the one before that was a very, very toxic workplace. So there was that on top of things. Uh, I wasn't actually the only person to come out of that workplace. I ended up with a cancer diagnosis, unfortunately. That's how toxic it was. Um, I started my own marketing firm when I left just because you got to make money. So I'm sitting in the IV chair designing my website because got to do something. Uh, and what else did I do? I uh, changed my entire diet. Uh, changed my lifestyle. Um, no more drinking. I used to drink wine by the bottle. I used to be a huge cigar smoker. So I would just smoke cigars every single day. Uh, uh, Christina, you, I'm sure can relate. Yes, absolutely. That, I mean, not the cigars. I smoked cigarettes back in my day, but yeah, I mean, Justin actually got into cigars recently, but anyway, yeah. I know that's crazy. It's crazy. The things that you think that you're like, this is just part of who I am. It's an identity thing. I mean, uh -huh. that was like, I was like, I love to drink and it was like very social and it was very part of like, I'm this fun person and you can, we can still be fun without drinking guys. That's, that's right. right. That's what I've been saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This will never, Lada has always like a half a cocktail and she's like, I'm loose. <laughs> I'm good. But yeah, I hear you. That is a huge overhaul. And I think that's the hardest thing for people to do. I mean, I'm sure you see it in your practice. I see it in, you know, Dr. Campbell's with, you know, her patients that you put on their thing after you get their Dutch test back and your, their adrenal labs. And you're like, y'all like, listen, meditation, blue light blockers, sleep. Yep. And then the next follow-up, it's like, I did the diet. It was amazing. And then it's like, how's your sleep? Are you meditating? No. And I'm like, you know, that's like the most important part. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. So it's great that you like really committed to this. I mean, just, so when did you go from like, I'm quitting the marketing job you did your own marketing firm to be like, I want to help other people. Uh, yeah. So, uh, when I finally got my cancer free diagnosis was kind of like, I was like, I like breathed a sigh of, of relief. Like, okay, my scans are clean. I'm okay. My TPO antibodies for my thyroid are negative. I'm good. I got no more itchiness. We're good to go. And, um, I was like, okay, so this, this shit works. <laughs> like, let's, let's teach other people how to do this and not just the nutrition and the lifestyle change and the alternative labs that help us find these markers, but also empowering people to freaking take control of their own health and their medical care. Right. And so that's when I decided basically. And that's when I was like, okay, well, 
marketing will pay the bills for a little while, but let's figure out how to do this. And I was at Paleo FX 20... 2018, the end of 2018. Isn't there a thing in like August or September or somewhere? No, I think it's in April. They might have a fall event. I was in, I went to Paleo FX 2018 in, in spring, but not in the fall. I Are don't you know serious? I missed you twice because I, I missed know. you at KetoCon. Too. I, we, I was there. We just didn't see each other. I know. It's crazy. I don't remember what year it was, but I went to some Paleo FX um, and I ran across this thing called FDN. So functional diagnostic nutrition, um, is a, is a health coaching certification by Reed Davis. And it like the thing that caught my eye was this big banner that said test don't guess, which is like an, I, I live by that in marketing. It like data rules my world. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can get access to labs as a holistic practitioner. I don't have to be a licensed practitioner. This is amazing. So I sat through their talk and then like Two days later, when I got home, I signed up and I went for it. I graduated last June. And in the process of going through that program, I was like, holy crap, this is exactly the troubleshooting process I went through with my naturopath. It's like, this is exactly what I'm looking for in terms of how I can pay this forward and help other people. So that was wonderful. And then after that, I went ahead and got um, NTP certified through the NTA. So I just recently graduated from those guys in November. And then I'm going on to do an oncology nutrition degree or certificate as well. So I can specifically get into the nitty gritty with active cancer patients. Because right now I work with a ton of people with autoimmunity and a ton of survivors looking to avoid recurrence. We're trying to get to the bottom root cause of what got them sick in the first place. But I don't have a lot of active cancer clients, um, most mostly because they're kind of tapped on resources already. And then also it takes a special kind of conventional oncologist to be willing to work alongside a holistic practitioner. Um, but that is kind of the holy grail. I would love to give those guys complementary holistic options that are alongside their conventional treatment options, just to like fortify the body where they're going through these toxic treatments. Absolutely. I love the FDN. I, I wanted to, I looked into their programming, like before I started working for Dr. Campbell, because I agree that the NTA, like that, it's a great curriculum. I mean, you learn a lot and it works. The foundational approach, it mm -hmm. works, but the testing because you know the the knack is good but again it relies on people answering honestly or like being in tune with that and not everyone is so i agree when you can, when you're able to do a gi map like a stool test when mm -hmm. you're able to run a dutch test when you can run yep. like a metabolic profile you're like mm -hmm. aha and it, and then you can recommend supplementation that's like on the nose what they need and that's, that's when right. you see the changes that's when it's like boom this is what you need instead of that kind of guesswork where people and that happens. A lot of people, they end up buying a lot of supplements, trying a lot of protocols. And it's this kind of like Goldilocks situation. Um, uh -huh. And that can work too, but it takes longer and it costs more money. That's right. Yeah. Most of my clients come to me and they're like at their wits end. I've tried everything. I've spent money on everything. I've been through every single specialist. Help me. I can't do this anymore. And so that's exactly what we do. A lot of my uh, statement labs or the labs I run on most folks include Dutch and GI map. And then I often do uh, the MRT for food sensitivities mm. just to cut through the noise on elimination dieting because it's just hard for a lot of folks. And I love the MRT because it measures just changes in white blood cell populations. So it's every mediator that's released. So I can look for patterns. Oh, I see spinach and almonds and uh, cocoa. So maybe we got an oxalate issue here, or I can look and see maybe there's a histamine or whatever it is. I can see patterns. So it's not just, oh, you're sensitive to dairy. Stop eating that. It's, I think you might be sensitive to these things, but also nightshades or whatever category of foods may be harmful to that person. That's awesome. Yeah. That's the only like food one that I kind of, and then I, I, people are always like, oh, can I do like the pinner test or the Everly Well? And I'm like, don't waste your money. Um, but MRT, but that one's just, an, it's expensive, unfortunately, but it, it is, is very good. Yeah. It's like 500 bucks, but it's, it's legit. If you really don't want to do an elimination protocol, I would say that's the only one that could replace that, you know? Yep. Yep. For yeah. sure. Well, that's the folks good. that I see are so they just, they feel so crappy. They can't handle an elimination diet on top of what they're dealing with. And right. so that helps with a little bit of a shortcut right. rather than eliminate everything. And AIP yeah. is really popular with a lot of my clients. And it's great if you're sensitive to something that's eliminated on AIP, right. but I got folks come in and pork is the problem or right. beef or like stuff that's not picked up by AIP. Yeah. And Cause then, everything, everyone's different. And for sure, it's not, there's no one size, like mm -hmm. there's no elimination protocol that's going to be perfect for everybody. Like there's still right. going to be something, 
you know, there, like for me, I did AIP, but starches ended up being quite an issue for me. And I had to figure that out, you know, on my own. Um, tell me a little bit more about, you know, you mentioned like working, you want to work with people, like you work with a lot of survivors. And I, I, when I lived in Hawaii, I had a, my neighbor had a friend, Karen, and she came to Hawaii to do the, this, the, you know, the, the cancer the survivor or the breast cancer walk. And, and it, was, oh, yeah. it was when she hit five years cancer free. But I remember talking to lunch in lunch after, you know, just talking about life after. Yeah. And I remember thinking like, oh my gosh, like no one thinks about it. Like she had this laundry list of side effects that she lived with long-term that again, people don't really talk about because you're like, yes, I'm cancer-free, amazing, I'm thriving. She was this hopeful, vibrant, amazing woman. But I had no idea, you know? And so tell us about a little bit about that. Like, what are you seeing with your patients and with your, with your clients? What do you see with them that's like kind of recurring and how do you support them with that? Yeah, so uh, when it comes to survivorship in cancer, the biggest thing is that there's, there's a huge gap. Um, when you're going through your um, cancer journey for healing, everyone's got your back. Everyone's checking in. Your doctor is very like up in your face, trying to make sure you're hitting your appointments and doing all of your treatments and all of the things. And then once you finally get to ring the bell or you get to say, yes, I'm cancer free, you get abandoned. And nobody realizes this because they're like, oh, you're healed. Great. You're good. Right? Yes. Right. And, and physically you might be healed physically. You might be dealing with a lot of side effects. Fatigue is huge. Pain is huge. Lymphedema is huge because surgery and radiation kind of kick your butt. Um, chemo brain is another thing that happens a lot when people can't think straight or they lose their memory. Um, hair growing back or growing in weird, um, folks who had straight hair and now they've got curly hair when it grows back again, this is a different experience and it's just hair, but it's important to people. (laughs) So a lot of these things I see over and over again, but the biggest thing that's missing is often just the support. The emotional support is just no longer there because everyone is like, you're good, right? It doesn't really work like that. When you go through cancer treatment or something as catastrophic as a cancer diagnosis, your entire identity changes. So You're in like, I'm a cancer patient identity mode. And then once you get the cancer free label, now it's like, who am I? Who do I want to be now? So I quit my job or my job was taken away because I couldn't be there. Or now I'm going through side effects and I can't be there because I'm too tired or it hurts to sit all day or whatever it is. And then you're also like, well, what did I do to contribute to my illness? What kinds of changes do I need to make in my life? Do I, did I get rid of toxic relationships when I was going through cancer treatment? Am I realizing now that some of these relationships are toxic and I need to get rid of them now? Like this is your whole world comes under evaluation and you start to kind of figure out like, how am I going to live as this new person post cancer? And nobody's really there to help. And nobody talks about this piece. Right. Another huge piece is sex. Right. If you go through gynecological cancer treatment, you have lasting change, could be damage to that area. So in my uh, surgery, so one of the things about lichen sclerosis specifically is that you can lose architecture. You get atrophy of the area, but your labia minora will actually fuse to labia majora. So you actually lose the small lips of your vulva. I don't have any, mine are gone. And then if you go through surgery, whatever has to be removed is removed. So I've got one, my right side is fused. The other side got cut off. So they're just, they're just not there. So I got a funky looking vulva. Like it looks weird. And then there's also the trauma associated with that part of my body. Like you're familiar with trusting your body after you've gone through something like autoimmunity, but then there's also just trusting anybody else in that area because I was asleep for half an hour while someone was down there fiddling with stuff and taking pieces out. And that's like, I still can't wrap my head around that. It's just the weirdest thing that someone was in there doing that to my body. And I didn't, I didn't know what was going on because I was knocked out. It's just and weird. It's different afterwards. I mean, Right. And that it's, you know, I, when, after I had my son, granted, I always had the HS, which of course affected like around the areas, but even sometimes you could get like boils on like the, on the outer labia and mm-hmm. like, which again, the scar then leaves it like a little like misshapen, you know? Yep. 
And so it definitely, like, I definitely relate to that. Right. And dealing with that, we're not just another party, like a doctor, but another party in terms of like your spouse, even yes. like, because as it's a changing landscape and then like in, and even dealing when you have pain and discomfort, like even before the surgery, like even before remission, I remember Justin was the first partner I had that I actually sat down and talked to this, like talk to them about this before. I just be like, let's just, just a really drunk and pretend no, we're not uh-huh. noticing. Yep. Like, let's yep. just get blackout drunk and no one remembers anything and we're good to go. Oh yeah. But I don't yeah. think I ever had sex sober till yeah. after I was through this healing journey. <laughs> yeah. Right. That, that was me before I met Justin. And then it was like, okay, I, let's sit down. I'm going to like, let's talk about this. And even then it was really hard to, to be intimate, to like, even during sex, not focus on what are they going to see? What's going to hurt? Is this going to hurt? I'm like, like logis- logistics, the logistics alone, just like, or just all you thought about. It was a lot. Or, or yeah. in your case, Heather, I, I'm curious because you were so young when your symptoms began from your condition, like so, so young. So essentially like your, your concept of your sexuality and your relationship to your body really developed along with this condition and this identity and also no one around you helped you give it a name give it give you an answer so I'm I mean I I would love to almost hear like your love story with your husband because because I can only imagine what you know developing in the sense where there there must have been pain there must have been so much pain and discomfort and I think as women, we are also so trained to bypass that pain to fit a certain idea of, well, this is supposed to look that way. So I'm just going to grin and bear it and get through it and just like pretend. Mm-hmm. And all of all of that, like what that does to us and our ability to feel pleasure, to enjoy sex. I mean, I had, which I won't get into, but I did have in my 20s an experience where I associated pain, sex with pain, and I just stopped wanting to ever have sex I like was crazy in love with my partner loved them to death but I just didn't want to have sex with him and I felt so guilty about that I I'd love to hear from your experience like also because you're so comfortable talking about your vulva, your body your experience like that's not normally the case with someone who has experienced pain as a child so I mean you're just amazing and I'm in awe please share about that if again this is something you've consented to I would never ask you beforehand if we hadn't agreed that we could go into this conversation yeah no problem at all. are we good cool yeah. so um oh that's a big question so uh I I didn't know what normal vulvas looked like until I reached adulthood and I saw them in pornography, in textbooks, in um, pictures that I was looking up online when I was doing my own self-diagnosis research. I had no idea that mine looked different until I figured out that LS was a thing. I had no idea. It was just normal for me. I've always had um, white skin, uh, not always white, but it's always been white or red or some shade in between. It's never been the normal healthy pink. Um, it is now, thank goodness. Um, I've always had scar tissue. I've always had weird seams where the skin had been fused together in areas. Um, It's always been swollen with inflammation. It's just always kind of been that way. And so I didn't know any different. So I just figured it was what it was. I'm Um, sorry to jump in for a second, Heather, but I do want to say that that must have been awful because what you see in porn and what you see in the media is usually not the way a vulva is supposed to look. It is a totally modified one dimensional version of a vulva, because as we know, there's like all colors and varieties and sizes and shapes. So even more like, oh, I'm way out of that spectrum. Right. So anyway, yeah, I wanted to just throw that in. No, I love that. Thank you. Um, And it wasn't, it wasn't really like, oh, that's what a normal vulva looks like. It was, oh, wait a minute. That vulva is different than mine. (laughs) And then that sent me through, well, let's go look. And then I found those infographics that have like all the different, like different colors and different lip sizes. And like, I was like, oh, cool. So maybe I am normal because it's just different. And so, meh, whatever. It turns out I was both different and scarred. (laughs) So, okay. Um, But with my, uh, with my sexual history, I think part of the reason I never had sex sober was because it masked the pain. 
Mm. So one of the things with, with, uh, lichen sclerosis is, uh, intercourse actually is very, very painful, like hot searing knife, stabbing you painful. Um, just similar to vulvodynia uh, as of that kind of pain. And so penetration was difficult. And then of course, any friction in terms of manual stimulation hurt. Um, oral was usually okay, but if there was any sucking, it was like, oh dear Lord, stop. <laughs> so we had to be careful there. Um, so it wasn't until I found Blake, who's my current husband, who's, he's the most amazing man in the world. Like I could do anything. And he's like, what do you need? <laughs> it doesn't matter. He's wonderful. And he never said anything. He's like, once I finally figured out what was going on and we talked about it, then he was like, well, I always noticed that it was a different color. He's like, but I never, like, I didn't get anything weird or like, I didn't know, never rubbed off on me. So I figured whatever, it's no big deal. Um, but at the worst, like at the height of the disease, I was avoiding sex because it hurt. And I just wasn't, I didn't feel sexy and I didn't feel like being intimate and my hormones were all fucked up, excuse me. So I didn't, I didn't really want to go there. And after a while of just making up excuses and pushing him away, it started to take a pretty big toll. And so that's when it was like, oh, we need to figure out what's going on. And then once he figured it out and he's like, oh, why didn't you tell me? I'm like, because I didn't like, who wants to talk about like stinky, gross, broken vag? I don't want to talk about this with you. I love you. I want you to see me like this, like sex goddess. I don't <laughs> want you to like, get all into that nastiness. And so he's like, I support you no matter what. And then once we started to heal after diagnosis and treatment and healing, this whole other thing like crept up on me. So the first time we were actually successful in terms of being intimate afterwards, I bawled and I'll probably cry now because I, I was just like swept up. Like, wow, we had like sober successful sex and it felt good and it didn't hurt. And I was like, just overwhelmed. That is amazing though. So, but that was surprising to me. I didn't realize like how much emotion is wrapped up in normal functioning of that area and that act so yeah it is it's it's so it is so emotional and it is so I remember after Jack was born we were in San Diego and I was at the low of my health and I remember I think I talked to you about this Laura I had a friend I, and I also had a friend a mom friend but I just, I remember thinking like, I think I need, I was like, I think I need to go to therapy. I'm like, I, I, I hate my vagina. Like I hate my vulva. I hate the area. I just see darkness. All I see is like there's scars and there's pain and it's embarrassing and nothing feels good. And I just, and I remember thinking like, I need, I need therapy because I can't overcome this. And yes, having, having sex and connecting with your partner and being intimate and having intercourse and not having to worry about anything else, except just like all the feelings is Just getting into it, getting into it. It is, it is, it's so beautiful. And that's amazing. And I think we all, we're all crying with you. It's great. Yes. I, I think pain, especially there for us, it's so wrapped up. And especially when you're in relationship and the, t and the parts of you that have kind of, you've sacrificed and have remained silent and have bared the pain yeah. as though I think that's the part that releases. That's when you finally feel like you are fully present and you're not having to hold back any part of yourself. You're actually present and feeling pleasure and all of you is suddenly there. I think that's the overwhelming part. You're, you're not having to, you know, that silence that pain or hold something back, which is something that I wish we would never have done from the beginning, right? I wish, I, I have two daughters and I hope to raise them to know, to not bear it, that it should never hurt and that that needs to be talked about, addressed. Let's find out that it's not a place to hold pain. It's a place of creation and pleasure. So I, I know it's, it's almost like we're learning that. It's our, our generations, it's us as elders and future elders, it's these stories, that we must tell, that we yeah. must tell because women don't talk enough about sexual health, sexual pain, sexual pleasure. We just don't talk about it enough amongst ourselves to share amongst with each other. And that is- And having yeah. doctors- Yeah, having doctors that can help us. Um, I'm not going now. Oh, 
Um, I hear you. Okay. The, but having doctors like, you know, Heather mentioned, girl, you grow up with this condition. And I also had mine since I was very young. And I think that that like creates this layer of like conceal something that you conceal um, an embarrassment. And especially through the puberty and teenage years, like for me, for me, it was, it was being a teenager. And I don't know if boys in Miami, if people in Miami in general were just like, I don't know, just graphic, but like, I remember, and I was so, the girl who's friends with a lot of boys too. And like hearing them talk about like the girls they were hooking up with and like what they expected and what they liked. And I was just like, I'm like, one thing is not like the other, <laughs> you know, like, oh boy, you're um, going to get a surprise. <laughs> I mean, yeah, luckily I didn't hook up with any of my guy friends, but anyway, but it was just one of those things. It was like, I, I literally always like hooked up with people, guys who went to other schools. <laughs> never anyone went to, it was like that was my strategy that was like I'm telling you it's a whole thing it took up so much mental capacity and Did that's you do it that too? that's it you like have a strategy of how you're going to like fulfill that need right because you need right. sex like that's a need that's a it's like food water sex right. it's important right and you have like a strat like the fact that you have to put in that much mental effort into making sure that no one else finds out that you're different it's a, it's exhausting you should know right then and there something's broken right <laughs> And I think that having like, but if we had had doctors that we went to we were little, if we had been taught that we could talk about, you know, our vulva openly and that we can advocate for it and that there's nothing to be embarrassed. Imagine how your life and my life would have been different. Imagine the trajectory, like the experiences growing up and the lack of traumatic experience that we would have compiled, you know? And I think, and I, I just want that for other people. And I get a lot of people, I'm sure you also um, get people who have like, oh my God, you know, my daughter has LS, you know, and uh -huh. like, and um, that happens to me where like my daughter has HS and I'm mm -hmm. just like, and I'm like, oh, I, you know, I know what it's like to be a teenager. Yeah. But then how do we tell these girls, like you have like change your diet or your lifestyle. Like that's a big one for a teenager. Yeah. Or even for children. Yeah. yeah. That's hard. It's really difficult. Um, the other thing is I, I learned a few interesting things through my journey. One, not many people know what a vulva is. <laughs> that, that like shocked me. Like medical professionals don't know what a vulva is. I was like, because <laughs> everyone, when you have cancer, everyone wants to know, well, where, like what kind of cancer? And I would say, and this one's hard to pronounce. So it's vulvar cancer or cancer of the vulva is what I would say. And they'd be like, What's, What's a that? vulva? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What's that? And so I'd have to tell them, yeah, external female genitalia, that's your vulva. You know, the fun part for the guys, that's the, <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's the vulva. Yeah. And so that was interesting. Nobody knew what it is. Um, and then the other thing is I got a lot of flack from other women about my choice to keep my clitoris against conventional doctor's recommendations which opened my eyes to the fact that one, female identity is different for me than other people. And two, I don't think me some, many, the women I was interacting with value their sexuality like they should. Right. And that was huge. Um, it did seem to matter in terms of age and believe it or not race in terms of who was giving me flack. A lot of older women and a lot of uh, white women. So the women in my circles of color were like, I didn't have to explain anything. They were like, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That's traumatic. Like, no, you can't, like, I, I would have made the same choice. You can't let that go. That's crazy. But then there were other women and typically they were white and sometimes they were older and they would be like appalled and they would just jump to the conclusion that I was trading being able to orgasm with potentially dying of cancer. First of all, cancer is not like the media says, and it's like, oh my God, it's always going to kill you. I was early stage, 1B is only in the tissue, wasn't in the lymph nodes, different story. If I had been stage four and I couldn't live any other way, then maybe I would have made a different choice. And I always make sure people know that if they're looking at alternative mm -hmm. routes. Um, but they always jumped to that conclusion and then it was really kind of a life or death. Oh, but orgasm or clitoral stimulation or my identity as a woman, none of that is important if, if it means getting rid of cancer completely, because there's this fear instilled and this lack of importance put on female quality sexual of, pleasure. Quality of life afterwards. I feel like it's like survive yeah. at all costs. It's like, yeah. 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 So that was really interesting to, to learn that and see that. 
I see a lot of women in that particular like demographic, like you're saying, like conservative, older, a lot of times re religion is a factor, right? That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. We're like, well, sex is for re reproducing and not for pleasure. Um, yep. And I, I do see a, a lot of, um, you know, again, those kind of like just that, that disconnect from their sexuality, from, from their in the intimate part of themselves. Cause again, like you mentioned that, like the fun part, like that's the fun part for us too, you know, right, like right. That's for him, that's, for, that's our, that's for us. Exactly. And but I, it makes me wonder if there's a different type of role model for some of these women right. that are that don't live in white stereotypical white bodies. I wonder right. if there's a different role model. Like, are there moms displaying different patterns? Is is it a cultural difference? Maybe there's just an my circle of friends. More like maybe there's just a, a more and like uninhibited, you know? Because let's say our family, like you know, we we're, you know, we're Latin, we're Hispanic, we're Cuban, we're Latinas. And you would think like, yeah, we talk loud and we talk about all the things, but when you get into the older generation, like our, my mother and her older siblings and my, and my, and their cousins, they would, I would say they would not talk about that. They'd be, they're definitely more concerned about like Laura is now the one who's like buying them all vibrators and explaining to them like why they should be masturbating. And she's literally like gifting all of them. <laughs> vibrators. It's awesome. That's awesome. But it's something that they hadn't like, they, they did like, they did it like, that's not, they, they didn't do that. And yes, I, I wonder too, I mean, they're Catholic. So maybe, I mean, I guess keep, Latino people tend to grow up more religious. So I wonder if that's the common denominator. Um, but we see that as well in our community um, where yeah. we can be uninhibited in so many other ways, right? And like dance and this and all sexy. But when it came to, you know, uh, we had an aunt with, with atrophy. Essentially she had been, she had not been sexually active for so long and there was like fusing of the tissue and her doctor was just like, well, you can't have sex anymore. And it was like, and Laura was like, oh, hell no intervention, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. But absolutely. that being said, you know, sex hasn't, women's sexuality and pleasure and sex, when has it ever mattered? When has it really mattered? When has it been central to anything, to any story, to any experience? I mean, we have grown up in a society, in a culture, in a world, in a patriarchal world. Let's just like, let's just say it, where men's sex is what dominates and is what colors the landscape, de mm -hmm. defines it. We define our sex through them. Now, I mean, and this is only so new. I mean, if the Me Too movement is as new as it is, just, just beginning to speak about those imbalances in power and abuse of power in that arena, and this is all very new, what can, I, I understand these older women who grew up in a world where that was not, that wasn't in the collective consciousness. It was almost like, whoop, you don't speak about it. It doesn't exist. It doesn't matter. There's no value there. As long as you could make a baby, pleasure was not necessarily part of sex. Like, no, no, no. Reproduction is one thing. Eroticism, sex, pleasure, all of that. I mean, the women, of course, women experience that. There are those women who found that, those amazing revolutionary women, even quiet mothers who had amazing sex and never told anybody about it, but they just never told anybody about it. It was private. Women have remained private even with their pleasures for so long. And then maybe little by little, we are hearing voices. And maybe now we can find out about women who back in the day were doing these amazing things. And of course, there's, there's examples in history of like really advanced women in that arena. But in everyday society, especially here in like our Puritan um, American culture, you know, and if you're talking about religion, who are the two main female archetypes, the virgin and the prostitute, which is not even accurate, right? Because now we know that Mary Magdalene was no way a prostitute, but who's going to really know that? I know that because I just read a book about it. But I, I went to Catholic school when I was a kid. So I'm sure everybody there still thinks that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. You know, that prostitute virgin story. So a woman who has cancer and wants to keep her clitoris is like, you crazy prostitute, you. <laughs> oh. Pretty much. Like, what are you thinking? That's that's it. That, that may be the association. It's It's so wild. We have such a long way to go such a long way to go. We really do. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I think that it's a wonderful, I mean, Heather, but you were just like, well, screw you ladies who don't know how to orgasm and screw you doctors who are going to take my clitoris and I'm going to do it like my way and just incredible. And I mean, you're just, it's so inspiring. You're such like, you're just such an inspiration. And I think your story needs to be, you need to like say it louder and tell more people um, because, and that's why I'm, we're excited to amplify you here in the, the Castaway Kitchen, because I really think that it's incredible and and what you advocate for is incredible and how candid you are in in telling it and sharing is incredible you've left us in awe of you thank you not to say it wasn't terrifying it was terrifying to refuse conventional treatment it was terrifying to go through conventional treatment it was it was terrifying all the way around but in my brain i felt like chemotherapy and radiation and surgery and whatever was like a quick fix but going through the hard work to change my entire life, that was going to stick. That's long-term healing. That's like, maybe I can heal my body of cancer and avoid a recurrence if I change my habits. Right. So that's what was like doing the hard work for me. Absolutely. And you did do a beautiful marriage of, again, like where you did use something, like you mentioned, you opted for the, the surgery and you did, you know, and, but then with the powerful holistic modalities. And I, mm -hmm. again, like you mentioned, like there is no easy button, but- Right. You know, and the ones that you mentioned, like, uh, this could be faster, 35 days, radiation, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. But right. you'd be dealing with side effects forever. Yep. Um, yep. It really but, comes down to your personal values. Right. I didn't know when I started this journey that my normal function of my body was a very strong value of mine. Like that's a personal value. And that's kind of, I think what was driving all of my decisions is I got real clear about what my personal values were. And I think that's part of why I got sick in the first place. Mm -hmm. I was driving too hard on misaligned values. And that's how I got, that's how I broke myself. <laughs> it manifests. I mean, there's a whole, like, there's so much that's literature true. on that right? Mm -hmm. like living out of your values or without alignment of your true self and how your body will be like, you know, if you don't stop, it'll make you stop. Right. Yeah. And I think that that conversation alone is so powerful to have with your clients being somebody that, yes. you know, you have that so clear in you and you embody that clarity and that experience of that journey and being able to hold space for people who are entering that journey and just like be that guidepost you know, be that guidepost, ask those questions, share what you learned and what really made that difference for you. It's, it's just such a wonderful combination. And to see women like you who went through this process and be, came out so empowered and wanting to be of service. And obviously it just like lights you up when you talk about it, you, you, you're, you could go in any direction. And whether you're talking about labs, which you guys just like whoop, went over my head there and all those, or like the really personal human aspect of it and joining those two together. It's such a powerhouse, such a gift. So thank you so much for what you do. Really. I'm excited. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Yay. Tell everyone where they can find you. Are you taking clients um, mm -hmm. and all the, all the details? Yep. I am absolutely taking clients now. Uh, you can find all of the things about me on heathercohen.com. Last name is spelled C-O-O-A-N. And then I'm on social as Heather Cohen on everywhere. But my main website is kind of the best place. I publish a lot of free content. I'm working on getting a YouTube channel going to share as much free stuff as I can. Because uh, I know alternative practitioners are expensive, especially right now with the economy the way it is. And so I'm just trying to give as much away for free as possible by doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Thank we'll you. link that's everything. Awesome. Yeah. We'll link everything in the show notes and I'll be, you know, sharing all your stuff over the social media channels. So whoever, you know, follows me there, they'll get it as well, but I'm so stoked. Thank you so much for being on the show, Heather. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Such Laura, it was wonderful to meet you. Christina, it was fabulous to finally get to talk to you. Oh, I followed I you forever. We got to do this in like real life one day. We'll make one day. Post COVID yeah. once we can like go right. out and do when, we, when we're free to move around the country. <laughs> exactly. When we can migrate again. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Bye everyone. See you in the next show. Make sure to subscribe and leave a review.